Hello and welcome to Travels Through Time, the podcast made in partnership with Jordan Lloyd and Colograph. Peter Moore. Today we're going to be heading far behind enemy lines in World War II. We're going to be following a dramatic and heroic story from the early years of the SAS. This is the week when we stop to remember all of those who served in uniform throughout the brutal wars of the 20th century. The history of those conflicts from the trenches to the beaches is well known. But even today, historians are excavating new stories, stories that tell of colossal bravery and human sacrifice, all for a greater cause. One such story is of the SAS operatives who were parachuted deep into enemy territory in the days that followed the Normandy landings in June 1944. These were new elite units, and their mission was to disrupt and to delay the Nazi war machine as it whirred into action. Taking us back to the scene of one of the SAS's most audacious missions is today's guest. Damien Lewis worked for 20 years as a war and conflict reporter before he became a number one Sunday Times best-selling author. Damien's latest book is called SAS Band of Brothers. It's just out and the other day he took the time to tell me all about it. So here is Damien Lewis taking me on a travel back through time. Damien Lewis, welcome to Travels Through Time. It's a real pleasure to be talking to you today. Yeah, great to be with you, remotely at least. <laughs> okay, and let's make the most of this remote conversation because we've got a wonderful, engrossing, compelling story to talk about. And I've got so many questions, but I thought I'd start broadly with some questions before we get into the Travels Through Time format, which is based around the three scenes. But first of all, the book's about the SAS. and I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about the SAS at this very early moment in their history. Of course. So the concept of special forces really was developed in World War II. And largely it was Winston Churchill who, you know, we can thank for that. He was a diehard supporter of the concept, the idea of special forces from its very first proposing which was literally in the aftermath of Dunkirk. And, you know, as British and Allied forces had been driven out of the European continent, much of Western Europe had fallen to the forces of Nazi Germany. It was seen that that the British nation and and our vanquished allies needed to prove they had the will and the spirit and the wherewithal to strike back. Uh, The means to do so was, was, was seen to be special forces operations never been done before and it was a it was Churchill working with another chap both of whom had experience of the Boer War in South Africa who came up with this concept which was initially known as the commandos the idea being that small bodies of highly motivated highly trained men would strike behind the lines you know striking fear into the hearts of the enemy and indeed Churchill charged his earliest raiders to set Europe ablaze and to make sure that no enemy soldier would be able to sleep soundly in their beds at night. That was the, the beginnings of Special Forces, and this was in, in June 1940, just after Dunkirk. And Churchill urged his first commandos to get the first raid back across the Channel by the end of that month, by the end of June. And to give you an idea of how challenging that was, there were very few recruits, very few of whom had been trained. They had no equipment, very little weaponry, and they had to launch their first operation, which was codenamed uh, Operation Collar, uh, across the channel in RAF crash boats, so, so inflatable dinghies used to pluck downed airmen out of the sea. But indeed, 90 men did get across the channel, raided a German outpost, and, uh, and brought back everybody alive. Now, in the greater scheme of the war, it was but a pinprick. It was completely inconsequential. But for the British people, when it hit the newspapers, the news of the raid hit the newspapers the next day, this was like manna from heaven. This was what, we, what the British people needed to hear, that we had the will and the wherewithal and the courage to strike back and a leader who, who would enable us to do so. And of course, uh, across the Atlantic in America, you know, headlines in the US papers were the British Bulldog finds its bark. And it really did give people a sense that, 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 that the fighting spirit was there 
and that the threat of Nazi Germany could be stood against. And mm. from there, th these were largely seaborne commandos. Uh, Churchill uh, vowed that he wanted 10,000 seaborne commandos, but also thousands of airborne commandos raised as well. And so initially the volunteers were given a name, the Special Service Volunteers. The airborne commandos had the word air inserted into that name, so they became the Special Air Service Volunteers. And that's really the birth of the Special Air Service name. Yeah, the book, of course, uh, that we're talking about today is titled SAS Band of Brothers. And I think it's interesting to think of the brotherhood of the SAS. And right from the beginning, there's a particular kind of person that um, maybe you can tell me more about whether they were drawn to it or whether they were actively sought out by um, recruit recruitment processes. But there is a very particular kind of person. They're very young. They're very, I suppose, looking for adrenaline and adventure and they want to take risks. And I think these characteristics are captured in these early figures like David Sterling and later Paddy Main, first a Scotsman, a second an Irishman. But I thought you might tell us a little bit about a figure who features very heavily in your story, which is Captain Patrick Garston. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Absolutely, yes. Yeah. So all of those who stepped forward to serve in, in any of the Special Forces units were volunteers. So it took a certain type of individual to do that. A unifying factor was that they all burned to strike back against the Nazi enemy. And, and you know, they were, they were driven to wage war in freedom's cause. And, and that, that is a unifying factor of all these individuals. Captain Patrick Garstan was, in a sense, typified the, the, the type of individual. So he fought in the British Expeditionary Force in, in 39 and, and 40, was pulled off the beaches of Dunkirk, only just got off, was badly wounded, uh, was given a, a military cross in the field, awarded a military cross in the field, uh, recovered from his injuries partially, then deployed to North Africa to fight in, in, in the North African and East African campaigns was dogged by his injuries and eventually was ominously ordered back to Britain for, for final disposal, in other words, to be invalid out of the British military. And instead, and, and typically, he then volunteered for airborne training, after which he volunteered for the SAS. So this was a man who really should not have been serving in the military at all, and certainly not uh, in a front frontline role, and certainly not at the absolute tip of the spear, which was, of course, where the SAS tended to serve on these missions deep behind enemy lines. Continuing with that theme, the, the, the second in command of his patrol, Lieutenant uh, Hyacinth, or John Rex was his war nickname, Vihe, who held from Mauritius. Likewise, he had volunteered for airborne training in North Africa, had suffered a, 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 an accident during training, had been badly injured and was again banned from frontline duties and instead had managed to volunteer for the SAS and join the, the, the absolute most, most tip of the spear himself. Yeah, so that seems, kind of... I was just on. thinking as, a, as an observation at this point, it almost seems paradoxical that you might not be able to join the forces in a traditional manner, but you are able to become part of this elite unit. It seems strange, doesn't it? Do you know, it's not an unusual story. And I think actually what this boils down to is the, the resolute will never to give up. You have to have that hardwired into your soul to soldier and special forces units. You know, David Sterling, founder of the SAS, you know, he said his ideal unit was four men strong for several reasons. One, because if you only had a force of 80 men, but you could break them down into four man units, you could launch 20 operations, each of four men, uh, send them deep behind the lines and tie down thousands and thousands of enemy troops. So it really made special forces, the SAS, what you call a force, a force multiplier. Uh, and also when operating deep behind the lines, if you're only four man strong, you can hide and slip through the lines much more easily. And, and equally, because you are only four men, the bonds that you that you build with your fellow warriors uh, are very, very close indeed, which they need to be when, when carrying out these extended operations deep behind the lines. And so on those kind of missions, this will never to give up, never to give in, never to actually believe you were beaten uh, was absolutely essential. And, and that's why I think some of these, the, these 
individuals who had officially been invalided out actually made fantastic uh, special forces operators. It's a fascinating character study. And I, I mean, early on in the book as well, you write about this a moment that we would probably term as team building in the in the 21st century when they are given um you know it's almost like when they take a load of manage, managerial people out and make them go fishing for a weekend well there's a very very extreme and early example of this when they're sent on this mission to travel from one end of britain to the other it's quite funny it's it, but it feels new and exciting do you want to talk a little bit about that i'm sure you know which moment yeah. i'm alluding to yeah, so uh, the, the SAS, bear in mind, had only ever been a, a unit that was formed overseas, headquartered overseas, so formed in North Africa, soldiered through North Africa, then the Mediterranean and Italy. But in, in, in early 44, they were called back to the UK and they returned this piratical, motley, polyglot army, almost a private army, you know, boasting all different nationalities, including quite a number of Germans because there were any number of German and Austrian Jews who had seen terrible, terrible things happen to their families in the Holocaust had fled Germany and had ended up joining special forces because that was where they could, they could strike back hardest against the enemy that they so hated. And so they returned to the UK and, and they really did have their very special way of doing things. And, and they were then under the command of Lieutenant Colonel Blair Paddy Main, who really was the command of the SS for most of the war after Stirling was captured in 43. And Maine set his men what he, he termed the, the Around Britain Challenge, in which you had to get from point A to point B, generally from one side of the country to the other and back, racing against other small units of, of fellow SAS recruits. And you were given nothing but the uniform you stood up in and your weapon. And you had to beg borrow and steal and by whatever means complete that journey and try and be first home and indeed you had a hunter force on your trail of a police and home guard and to prove you'd actually completed the journey properly you had to sign in at various town halls and hotels on the way to prove you'd been there and so you know these individuals got up to the most extraordinary things they hijacked police cars they hijacked police stations. They even held up trains so they could co-op the train to take them on their journey. Actions which at any other time uh, than a time of extreme war, total war, would have been completely unacceptable. And, and whenever uh, uh, their, their actions uh, attracted the attention of the military police, which, as you can imagine, they did quite often, the MPs would, would head for uh, the SAS headquarters in Darvale in Scotland they would be confronted by Colonel Main, who was a, a former British Lions and Irish rugby international who stood six foot two, uh, was highly decorated and commanded this, this mysterious regiment, the SAS, with this fantastic emblem and this real mystique. And there were few, if any, MPs who could ever stand against him and try and make the charges stick. As far as Main was concerned, this was ideal training for behind the lines operations. Because of course, when you're in hostile terrain, uh, you know, and, and you're dropped into territory where the, the, the locals may be friendly, but they may be hostile, and certainly the military on the ground is trying to hunt you down, you have to be ready to use all means, uh, all and every means to ensure your survival and that you will complete your mission. So that's a really good, I think, contextual overview of where the SAS came from and what was happening with them during the years of the second world war but now i want to ask you the question that i ask of everyone that comes on this podcast and if you were to go back and have a look at the sas in one year which year would you choose well i'd choose 1944 for the simple reason that the sas were recalled to britain to prepare for these these absolutely essential vital d-day missions and to give you an indication of how important they were, they were ordered to, to swell the numbers of, of, of the SAS from a few hundred to 2,000 strong. And so they, they went on a massive recruiting drive in the UK. And the reason for that was because Allied planners knew that once D-Day was launched and once Hitler and his top commanders knew which beaches we were landing on, they would then send their, their panzer division, so their heavy armour, to those beaches 
in an effort to drive the Allied forces back into the sea. So something was needed to stop them. And of course, there would be the RAF and the US Air Force carrying out airstrikes. But those could only do so much. And certainly at night, they could only identify those convoys on the move that could be seen. And so the SAS were slated to be dropped deep into occupied France to carry out sabotage operations against rail movements, road movements and, and, and convoys to try to block the German heavy armour from reaching the D-Day beaches. From that, would you like to take us to the first scene in 1944 that you'd like to describe for us? Yes, yeah, so this 12-man SAS patrol, codenamed Sabu 70, uh, Sabu most likely standing for safe all business as usual, which was a standard um, phrase that you would send back on the radio to let headquarters know that you were okay in the field. So Sabu 70, the, the, the code name for this 12-man stick of parachutists, drop just to the south of Paris, about 20 miles to the south of Paris, shortly after D-Day, to land in a moonlit cornfield. And their mission is to blow up a train that they know will be passing through the rail cutting north of the nearby town of Dourdan sometime in the next 48 hours. They don't know exactly when. And at the same time, in that cutting, they know from intelligence there are scores of ammo dumps which the trains use to replenish supplies and, and take the ammunition to the D-Day beachheads, to the armoured divisions, to rearm them so they can try and throw the Allies back into the sea. So that's the raison d'etre of the mission. And the challenge is to find out exactly when that train will be passing through. And so having made the drop successfully, uh, Patrick Gaston, captain uh, of the mission, calls his men together and sends Corporal Serge Vachulik a man of Czech birth, but French by nationality, serving with the free French SAS. He dispatches him into Dourdan on foot with a great coat and a cap slung over his uniform as a kind of makeshift disguise to find out intelligence and find out when that train will be passing through so they can sabotage it and blow it up and stop can the armament. Can I carrying. stop you there? Because yeah. um, I wanted to ask you a little bit more about Serge, because yeah. he has the most extraordinary biography. Even before this moment, he's lived this picaresque life of being captured, escaping. Obviously, he's a slightly peripheral character anyway, because he's a, a Czech in France, and then he's ended up in Britain. And obviously, he's... In the book, one of the characters that is most vivid, and we follow his story very, very closely. Could you tell us a little bit more about him, please? Yes, Vachelet was an absolutely fascinating, extraordinary character. So he was born in Czechoslovakia, but his family moved to France when he was quite young. And so he became a French citizen. And at the outbreak of the war, he was serving in the French army and was captured at Dunkirk. And in the march south and eastward towards Germany under guard and, and himself having suffered injuries during the, the, the retreat to, towards Dunkirk, Vachelik and one other uh, Frenchman decided they had to escape and they had to escape before they crossed the border into Germany itself, after which they felt it would be impossible. And so one night they sneak away and they dive into a river, having stripped themselves of their clothing. Uh, hoping that it will that they can swim across it and reach the other side and slip away, and in the process of which Vachelik is swept downstream, loses his companion, and so begins what is an a, an, an epic escape and evasion across all of France, all of Spain, into Portugal, and finally to the UK, during which Vachelik's adventures are breathtaking, and and that they last for many months. I mean, just to give you a few. Um, you know, suggestions as to what happens. He's at one stage. He has to fight off a a dog that attacks him with his bare hands. Uh, he has he he repeatedly escapes from enemy captivity after they've recaptured him. He's imprisoned by the enemy. Uh, he's befriended at one stage by an Austrian count, who's also in prison and given a letter to carry to his sister in London which almost results in Vachelik being arrested and shot as a spy when eventually he does make it finally to the UK. And he does so eventually on a, uh, on, on, in a convoy of ships bound for Britain, uh, which themselves are almost shipwrecked through a terrible storm. So Vachelik's journey, even before he gets to the UK, is quite beyond belief. He then volunteers for the um, 
the French Parachute Regiment, uh, trains as an, airborne, uh, as an airborne trooper, finds himself uh, frustrated at the lack of action, and so then sees an opportunity to volunteer for the SAS because they need, uh, desperately need, fluent French speakers for the coming D-Day missions, because of course, they'll be dropping behind the lines, they'll be very often linking up with French resistance fighters, and so having French speakers amongst their number is absolutely key. And that's how Vachelik ends up soldiering with the SAS and becoming part of Captain Garstan Stick. And it's also the reason why on that, well, once the drop has been completed, that he's the one sent out to search for intelligence, isn't it? Because he speaks French and um, I, I think pretty much uniquely so among the, uh, this group of 12. Is that right? There's maybe another French speaker, but he's the one who is going to go and gather this information yeah he's the native french speaker he's french of, french of nationality he's lived there most of his life of course the second in command on the mission lieutenant vihe who's from mauritius which is a former british and french colony also speaks french fluently but it, of course it will be with a mauritius accent so vachelik is the one who can slip through the local population as, as, as a bona fide frenchman of course vachelik himself has a cover story because Ironically, because of the armistice, the French signed with the Germans. Officially speaking, a Frenchman fighting with the Allies is doing so illegally. So if Vachelik is captured by the enemy and they find out he is French, you could argue they have the right to execute him as a spy. And so Vachelik's cover story is that he's actually called Serge Dupontel. Dupontel is his official surname, and that's what all the men are supposed to call him on this operation and that he's actually a French Canadian and he's carrying French Canadian papers to kind of back up that story. And on this day, he does remarkably well yet again, doesn't he? Do you want to take the story forward? Yes. Yeah, so he, he makes his way into Dourdan on foot. Um, he's drawn to this cafeteria, this French cafe, uh, for whatever reason, steps inside, orders himself a cognac for breakfast, which is not unusual in France, often that's what the workmen do. They have a coffee and a cognac before starting work, gets talking to the barman and eventually shows him his red, because they were then at that stage red, SAS Beret, at which stage the barman says, we've been waiting for you, thank God you're here, takes him into the kitchen, orders his wife to cook him a slap-up breakfast and says, you know, what, what, what do you need from me? And Vachelik says, I need to know when the train's due. And the cafe owner says, well, the local station master is a staunch member of the resistance. He, come, he normally drops in at 11 o'clock for a coffee and a cognac. When he does so, he can give you chapter and verse. And so Vachelik is waiting for, this, for the station master to arrive. And lo and behold, the door does cling and opens. But instead, a patrol of German soldiers arrive. And of course, Vachelik is uh, you know, uh, somewhat rooted to the spot. Uh, and he hopes they will all stay in the cafe and not come to the kitchen. Why would they? But one German, curious, comes and, start, and comes to the kitchen doorway and engages Vachelik in conversation, claiming he's keen to practice his French. Now, fortunately, Vachelik's got his feet under the table, so hiding his footwear. He's wearing this thick greatcoat, so he's actually got his British uniform hidden because these, you know, bona fide troops, all of Garstaner's men have deployed in full British uniform. And he managed to bluff his way through and eventually the German soldiers leave, whereupon the station master, master turns up and is able to give Vachelik chapter and verse about when the train is due through. Uh, he does suggest one thing, which is that if there are Frenchmen operating the locomotive, at, as, as they generally would be, because although the Germans used the trains to carry uh, military supplies, it was generally French staff still running them, French rolling stock he does request that he might pass the engine driver and his, his, his men a quiet warning to expect something be ready to evacuate the train. And so that being decided, Vachelik then makes his way back to the forest hideout where Garstan and his men are laying up for the day and brings them chapter and verse on their target. And this intelligence that he gathers during the trip to the cafe on that morning is obviously critical. And I think it would be good 
if you told us how this particular mission plays out over the next day with this information in hand? Yes, yeah, so now, now knowing the timing, Gasta organises a, a reconnaissance of the targets which they carry out. They, they carry out a recce of the ammo dumps and of the tunnel and of the guards, and they work out their plan of attack for the following night. And that night, the night the train is due, all 12 track to the target under cover of darkness. Without being seen or noticed, they plant charges on 50 separate ammo dumps hidden amongst the trees. And these charges have four hour delays. So the fuses are set to go off in four hours time, giving them plenty of time to get away. And then they move down to the tunnel through which the train will have to pass, whereupon comes the most bloody and up close killing of the night where Vachelik and one other have to go and knife to death the two sentries who are keeping watch on the rail line. And why do they have to kill them with a knife? Well, they have to kill them silently because otherwise the German guard force who are, who are quartered just nearby will be alerted and the, the sabotage of the train won't take place. So the guards having been killed, they set up their ambush positions on one side of the cutting, on the far side of the tunnel, and they wait for the train to steam through. And with typical German efficiency, it arrives on the hour. They've planted charges on the line with these um, special operations executive SOE developed devices called fog signals. And having set those charges, the train comes steaming through, hits the fog signals, derails cataclysmically, whereupon Garstan orders his men to open fire and, and they start to rake the, the, the shattered remains of the carriages. With, with machine gun fire from their Bren guns mainly and their Sten guns. There are German survivors. Obviously the guard force station need nearby are alerted. There is a counter attack and eventually Garstan orders it's time for every man for himself to withdraw. And as they run down the railway line in the direction that they've prearranged they're going to try to escape, there's a, a, a corporal on the patrol called Thomas Ginger, was his nickname Jones, a short, stocky redhead from Wigan, who was a former miner and was actually one of the original founders of the SAS alongside David Sterling. And Ginger Jones stands firm with a Bren gun levelled at the hip and manages to hold off those pursuing the German troops in pursuit for long enough to ensure that everybody gets away, all 12 of the men get away, and Jones himself only suffers a flesh wound in one arm. Now they then have a, a horrendously challenging trek to undertake to get to the place where they've decided they're going to lie up for the night in a remote patch of woodland before sunup, at which stage, of course, they can expect to be remorselessly hunted. And as they move through the trees, through the darkness, three hours later behind them, the charges go up on the ammo dumps and the whole of the horizon is, is lit up in this massive, angry orange glare as all those ammo dumps blow up and they realise the second part of their mission has been a success. And by the time they actually go to ground in the woodland, uh, just as the sun is rising, they can see on all sides patrols of German soldiers out in force tasked to hunt them down. You're describing something which is obviously a spectacular success. Let's get on to the second scene because this has a very different feel. Can you describe where you'd like to go next, please? Yes, yeah, so, so next we're, we're dropping in again. It's a parachute jump, but it's into a different drop zone. It's the same 12 man team, pretty much under Patrick Garstan's command. It, it's now uh, July 44, and they're parachuting into, they're an air base, sorry, called a Tormp, and, and just adjacent to a, a village called La Ferte, or a hamlet, a French hamlet, called La Ferte Allais. It's nighttime, it's a moonlit night, and again, initially, it appears as if it's been a very successful drop. And this is where things, well, as we said before, things just tended to go right in the scene that we were describing before. There was lucky chances, there was escapes, there were uniforms that were concealed. On this occasion, it's a completely different story, isn't it? Absolutely. So it's the complete opposite. And what's happened is that the, the Gestapo are headquartered in Paris have been very, very smart at, at perfecting something they called the Funkspiel, which is German for radio game. And at its very simplest, they would capture generally an SOE, special operations executive agent, male or female, and they would force them by obvious means to, in some cases, 
to send false radio messages back to special operations headquarters in London to make it seem as if the circuit that they were supposedly operating was still free and operational at large. And the reason for doing that was so that they could actually lure in further airdrops of agents, supplies, weaponry, and even money, which would drop directly into the hands of the SS and the Gestapo. And on this night, Captain Patrick Garstin and his men have unwittingly, unknowingly to them, been the subject of a funkspiel. And they actually parachute into a cornfield, which has been surrounded many hours before by a force of Gestapo agents and, and Waffen SS soldiers who are primed and ready and waiting for them. Now, they only expect there to be containers dropped because that's the, the, the nature of the intelligence they've gathered from these Funkspiel radio signals. But actually, 12 figures plummet from the belly of that Sterling warplane plus the containers. And those waiting on the ground very quickly realise that they've, that they've hit the jackpot tonight and they're, if, they can, if they can capture them all, 12 British soldiers or agents are going to fall into their hands. How many people were they met by as they came down? Because obviously the things when you're kind of coming into any territory, you're enormously vulnerable. And it seems like they were sitting ducks. They were. Uh, you know, so there are several dozen uh, uh, Waffen SS um, soldiers waiting for them in pre-prepared positions. There's around about half a dozen Gestapo. And then there are were they French collaborators? There were Frenchmen who had been dragged out of captivity. But for whatever reason, Captain Garstan, leading as always from the front, is the first man down. And a figure walks out of the trees to greet him, dressed in, 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 in typical French civilian attire, and, and shouts like, Vive la France, which is a typical way for the resistance to receive SAS on the ground. And Garstan goes over to shake his hand. And, and as the Frenchman gets close enough, he, he hisses, beware, there are Bosch, there are Germans all around. And as he leads Gaston into the, French, into the nearby patch of French woodland, figures emerge with, with weapons at the ready and Gaston is surrounded by the enemy, at which stage they order him to call the rest of his men in towards him as if he was still free and at large and, and so they can all be captured. Gaston, of course, refuses. He tries to break away. Uh, the enemy opened fire and he's shot three times and, 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 and falls to the ground, grievously wounded. Um, and, and with the rest of the patrol, so 12 men drop, and you can imagine, with the speed a Sterling bomber is flying at, even though they try and jump as closely packed together as possible to keep the stick together in the air, and so they drop on the ground as close together as possible, they are still strung out over quite a distance. And the last three, in the stick actually don't drop in the clearing, they drop in the French woodland. And that's actually their blessing because those three are the, are the ones that manage to get away. They're not captured. The rest are all killed, wounded uh, and captured. And, and, and in many cases, pretty much fight to the last round in terms of- And, and that's the to... point I was going to make because there's also maybe another aspect that you cover in the book as well, which is that there was some knowledge within uh, British military that there had been an order which comes from very high up in the Nazi regime that they would shoot prisoners is that right um, yeah because this kind of maybe explains um, a little bit more about the context of what was happening you're absolutely right so there had been a number of SAS captives men taken captive that we knew had been taken captive who had mysteriously disappeared. Now, bear in mind, these men may well be on behind the lines operations, but there's nothing illegal about that. You can wage war in whatever position relation to the enemy, that's completely within the laws of war, as long as you are wearing a, a bona fide uniform of that military, which they were, especially on these missions. And so even if captured, they should have been afforded the protections of the Geneva Convention and treated as bona fide prisoners of war that didn't seem to be be happening so this firefight ends with how many being taken um away and how many mortally wounded nine are taken captive three escape of the nine taken captive one of them trooper howard lutton uh, from uh, from ireland is on death's door and by the time they reach paris and are taken to the the hospital salt petrier 
in, in Paris, Luton is pronounced dead. Three others are, are, are lodged at the hospital. Catherine Patrick Garster, uh, very grievously injured. Lieutenant Vehe is second in command, even, even more seriously injured. So shot, heavily, heavily wounded, m most crucially of all, most debilitating of all, shot in the spine and pretty much paralyzed from the waist down. And also a, a, a further SAS trooper, whose surname was, was Vary, also put into hospital. But the rest, those who are either lightly wounded or not hurt at all, are loaded aboard uh, Gestapo vehicles and driven to the 84th Avenue Foc, which was the notorious Gestapo headquarters in Paris. Hello, it's Peter here. We're talking about the SAS missions behind enemy lines with Damien Lewis today, but of course, the more familiar picture of June 1944 is of the D-Day beaches. Well, among our special set of TTT colorized images by Jordan Lloyd of Colorgraph, we have a superb portrayal of just that time. It's a photograph that was taken at 7.40 in the morning of the 6th of June, 1944 at Omaha Beach in Normandy. It shows a group of soldiers from the US 1st Infantry Division wading from the shallows onto Omaha Beach. It's a fascinating image, even in black and white. But with all of Jordan's research into the colour of the uniforms and the landing craft and that gauzy atmosphere of that uncertain summer morning, it really becomes something else. As we head into the Christmas season, you might be wondering what present to buy that history fan in your family. Well, images like this one of the D-Day beach is really worth checking out. Head to colorgraph.co to have a look. And if you enter the code TTT at the checkout, you'll get an extra 10% off any order. We've done June, which was the very, very successful operation on the train line and the ammunition dump. We've now seen in July, this um, disastrous moment of the firefight in the clearing. We're going to go to August 1944 next. Do you want to tell us what's happening there? Yes, so by early August 44, the, the SAS held captive in Paris had been interrogated, tortured very badly. Uh, those in hospital had been given no medical treatment whatsoever. In fact, they had also been tortured and interrogated. But the powers that be in Nazi Germany had decided they had no further use for these men anymore. And an order comes down from Hitler himself that these men the SAS captives are to be dressed in civilian clothing, so removed of their uniform, driven to a patch of French That's symbolic, wood. isn't it? Sorry, just a point in the, taking off the the uniform is hugely symbolic because it's almost like stripping them of their rights as soldiers in war. Absolutely. So you know the, the, this 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 order that from Hitler that they should be stripped of their uniform and dressed in French civilian clothes is fiercely resisted by by the men. For very obvious reasons, their uniform is their is their cloak of protection. It identifies them as being bona fide combatants who should be afforded the protection of bona fide prisoners of war. And and they do try and resist this. They do try and refuse to change. And they are then told what can only be described as a devious and cruel cover story. So the Gestapo commander Keitha comes up with this story that they are to be driven to Geneva whereupon they're going to be exchanged with German prisoners of war held by the British. And the civilian clothes are simply allowed them to pass across the Geneva border. Now, they still don't believe this, most of them. They still try to resist, but at gunpoint, they are forced to change out of their uniform and into these unpleasant civilian clothes, some of which uh, already seem to have bullet holes in them very ominously. And then they're loaded aboard a, uh, a convoy of French trucks and driven north out of Paris towards uh, you know, a patch of French woodland in the depths of the night. And as that journey unfolds, uh, it becomes more and more obvious that they're not heading south, they're not heading to Geneva, and that the very worst can only uh, await them. Do you want to tell us what happens next then? So just before dawn, the convoy pulls up at a very remote patch of woodland near, near, a, near a, a settlement called Noailles. And the men are ordered off the truck lined up in an open field and marched at gunpoint into a patch of woodland. Now, Captain Patrick Garstan, as I said, very, very seriously injured uh, during the ambush. He's not had his wounds treated in any way, shape or form, 
for several weeks. He's in a very bad way. But he has a very decent, upstanding citizen, was Garstin. And he has chosen or preferred to believe uh, Kiefer, the Gestapo commander's story, that they are going to be exchanged for German prisoners. And it's only as they're led into this woodland and, and start to be lined up for execution, Garstin finally believes, realises, that actually they're all to be shot. And he turns to his men and says, I paraphrase, but he says, I don't believe it. They're actually going to execute us. And then he says to his men, and this, this really gives you the, the real sense of, of Garstin as an individual. He says, I will stand to take the fire. You make a break for it. And they all understand what Garstin means by this. He means, I am too injured to even try to get away, but I'll stand and be shot so that you guys might stand a chance. And indeed, that's what happened. So Schnur, the SS Gestapo officer in charge of the execution squad, pulls a piece of paper from his pocket and starts to read out the execution order from Hitler in German with von Capri, his deputy, translating into English. And as the words are announced, sentenced to be shot, Vachelik and Jones, the two corporals, let out these animal roars and charge their would-be executioners. And those two manage to break free. However, they don't get away very far because in these ill-fitting civilian clothes, their shoes are too large for them and they have no laces and they both trip over and fall to the forest floor. But ironically, that's the saving of them because the gunfire that comes after them goes over their heads for the very simple reason that they fall into the ground. Now Vachelik very quickly gets to his feet again and goes dashing off through the trees and Schnur orders his men to give chase because he's realised what will happen if Berlin finds out that he's failed to execute their orders and some have got away. So the hunt is very much on for Vachelik. Meanwhile Jones, with nerves of steel it has to be says, lies absolutely where he's fallen and stock still because he knows or he fears that if he moves or get, tries to get to his feet, he will be nailed full of bullets. And behind him, he can hear these volleys of shots right ringing out as his comrades are finished off on the ground. And only when all the would-be executioners have disappeared into the trees, chasing off the Vachelik mainly, does he get to his feet, slip away into the forest, and then find a thick bed of leaves into which he crawls, so he can hide himself. It's a it's a kind of terrifying scene. It's an extraordinary scene, and I think in a way we have these pictures in our head of you know these summary executions, which were becoming such a feature of that later desperate part of the the Second World War. And to to have someone escape one of those seems beyond you know kind of any expectation. People didn't just run away at these moments and get away did was it to do with their SAS training at that moment do you think that's what saved them I think it was to a certain extent but bear in mind you know in in the mindset of the SS and Gestapo guards and executioners these men had been ambushed some some were wounded they'd not had their wounds treated they'd been held at 84 Avenue fought for weeks on end on a starvation diet that had very little exercise I don't think they could conceive of the fact that they might be capable of such Herculean physical efforts. And indeed, when Vachelik escapes, he runs through the woodland, gets to the far side, and before him is this very, very high hedge, which delineates a field full of horses. And any, a, any normal individual, you might argue, would have, would have found that barrier insurmountable. But Vachelik can remember their training in Scotland and how they had to had to surmount the wall. Now the wall is, is at least 12 foot high. And so this hedge, it is mind's eye, it's the same as the Scottish wall. And he manages to get to the top of it, worm his way over it, vault down the far side and, and, and run across the open field. Whereas his pursuers, when they reach that hedge, they're unable to do the same. And so they're now fi firing at him, but blindly through the foliage. And that's what enables him to get away. So yes, it is this combination of the mindset, the never give up mindset. Uh, it's the combination of the training to be ready for anything 
and then the esprit de corps that despite everything they've been through, there is something that they still have to hold in their mind as being worth living for. And also bear in mind that there's all, always that animal instinct to survive, that natural human instinct to conserve one's life. But in this situation, Jones and Bachelet were driven to escape also by the burning desire to survive and, and come war's end to see the Gestapo and SS killers brought to justice and to stand trial. It's um, one of these stories that just gives out to another story because even on its own, the first scene that we looked at today would have been worthy of a book, of, certainly of a whole episode of this podcast that will just keep you reading. Vachelik in particular, can you just tell us a little bit about what happened to him in particular? Yeah, so Vachelik survived the war. You know, he, he escaped, he, he fought with French resistance was made the mayor of a local town upon its liberation, rejoined the SAS, fought with the SAS toward right to the end of the war, was wounded by a German sniper, um, and then um, led, spearheaded the quest for vengeance after the war to see his comrades in arms avenged. Well, that leads me on to my last question, actually, which is if you could get a memento, if you could reach your arm back into 1944 somehow and grab something for you know kind of yourself today what would you like is there anything from this story tangible that you would like to have as a memento do you know one of the most incredible parts of the story is what happened to lieutenant vehe the second in command remember i said he was very badly wounded from mauritius and, yeah he was the from one from and ended up um paralyzed in the waist down well he also survives the war and he returns to mauritius alive but but his wheelchair bound for life i've seen pictures of his SAS beret, the very one he wore during the war, which his family sent me from Mauritius. And of course, because of lockdown, I can't travel there. I can't go and see it. But if I could have anything, oh. I would love to have uh, Lieutenant Vehe's beret. It's, it's red, isn't it? Are they not green it nowadays? They, they were red in those days, at least. Is that right? They were, uh, they were beige, uh, at sandy coloured at, at the formation of the SAS, the sand colour reflecting the sand of the desert. Oh, I see. When the SAS was um, recalled to the UK, they were, they were obliged to, to, to revert to wearing the, the standard red beret of all parachute forces. But now, uh, after the war, they went back to wearing the beige beret and it remains that till today. Well, it's an, you know, it's an extraordinary story. You've told it with such intensity and skill. And I can only recommend that people who have been interested in this go away and read the book because it's all in there. Thank you very much, Damien, for talking to us today. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you. It's been wonderful. Really appreciate it. That was me, Peter Moore, talking to Damien Lewis. Damien's book is called SAS Band of Brothers. It's newly published and it's an absolutely addictive telling of a really compelling piece of history. Do check it out. For much, much more about this episode, of course, do head to our website, which is tttpodcast.com. There you'll find fascinating photographs and much, much more about biographies of characters like Captain Patrick Garstan and Ginger Jones. We'll be back with Violet Moller for a trip to Ravenna next Tuesday. But from me, for now, that's it. Thank you very much for listening. Goodbye. <laughs>